Arpaio has a long tradition of growing flavorful grapes that produce quality wines. It first began in the early 1800s when Nicholas Longworth, a pioneer in the commercial wine industry, planted Catawba grapes in Cincinnati above the Ohio River. His initiatives proved so successful that by 1859, Ohio had become the leading producer of wine. By the turn of the century, dozens of wineries inhabited the islands of Lake Erie, and thousands of gallons of wine were produced in the area, which soon became known as the Lake Erie Grape Belt. Although Prohibition virtually obliterated winemaking in Ohio, the post-Prohibition years of the 1960s marked a time of resurgence for Ohio's winemaking industry. Gathered together are several candid and unique stories told by the families and their children who established wineries and vineyards after Prohibition and during Ohio's winemaking resurgence over 40 years ago, an era when the wine industry was on the verge of redefining itself. I'm Arnie Esterer, Marco Vineyard, which was a, a small vinifera vineyard that was founded in 1968 by Arnie Esterer and Thomas H. Hubbard. Looking at this property, it had all the requirements for um, a good site, it was the proximity to the lake, the elevation of the lake. So I got talking to Tim Hubbard and about making wine, and he was an old Connecticut family that originally settled the Western Reserve. We were partners for 32 years. Tim was very uh, interested in the both the family and the history of this region and what it could do. I was 50 years old, my husband was 55. Tony Jr. came home from service and the professor wanted him to start a winery. With lots of help, we borrowed all we could and everybody thought we were crazy. And we built a chalet building, a large, large cellar, made wine and sold first bottle of wine March 22nd of 1972. Our family bought the property in 1927. Before the winery existed, it was always what they call a truck farm. So corn, potatoes, cabbages, things like that. Started here because my parents, uh, ancestors had the farm here. And you know, I just kind of started working on the farm and that led to making wine and growing, growing grapes. Wine business came back right after prohibition. Most of the grape growers who had sold grapes and, or grape juice, the private people suddenly lost that market. Now they could buy beer and liquor and you couldn't sell grapes. Couldn't hardly give them away. That's when my dad and his two brothers got together and set up the basement here and put in 20 barrels of grape juice, 1935 in the fall. Reading about wine and studying wine and drinking, making it at home, and I found that other people were making homemade wine. In reading about wine, there were two people that were very prominent in promoting wine in this region. One was Dr. Constantine Frank over in Hammondsport, New York, and Philip Wagner. From Philip Wagner, I read his book, Wine Grower's Guide, and there was a mention of Dr. Frank being up in the Finger Lakes and doing something with vinifera. My wife said one day uh, on a vacation in October, that if I wanted to work in the wine business, I should go work for a winery. In 1967, Esther was able to arrange a kind of internship with Dr. Constantine Frank, an expert on growing grapevines in upstate New York. In effect, Esther traded his labor for a crash course in growing grapes for wine. Frank taught Esther such cultural practices as the spacing of vines and how to protect them against winter winds and snow. Frank also checked varieties of vinifera most apt to survive Lake Erie's bluster and explained how the process of natural selection and adaption will sort out the right vines for the climate. His wife came out and said, uh, you looking for the doctor? And I said, yes, and he'll be right out. He's having a cup of coffee. So I'm standing there looking at Lake Keuka and uh, the vineyards he had uh, over a good site looking at the, on the west west side of Lake Cuca. So he came out and he just went down the hall and told me to follow him. And I was right behind him and he said, uh, who are you, a somebody or a nobody? And I said, I'm a nobody. He said, good, let's go to work. Really what Grandpa wanted to do was plant two or three acres of hybrids and American grapes for Myers Winery. That was the whole purpose. But he thought he knew what he was doing. So he ordered two or three acres for the grapevines he thought and 30 acres worth showed up. So overnight, we became the second largest grape grower in the state. It's been that way. A little bit of fluctuation with two guys up north for 47 years, and that's why we're here. But um, he planted in 69. They showed up. Commercially, we opened up in 1970. They brought in juice the year prior. 
from Edit It that we opened up on June 16th. All mistake-based. I mean, if whenever we plan something and it's a total negative on us, it never works. When it's a total accident or we like, eh, let's try it, it always works out. So the biggest thing we're known for visitor-wise is our weekend cookout. Uh, several of the other wineries do it now, but that was almost an accident again. In the winery world, and I tell people this all the time, there's the Ferrante angle, which is Italian food, and then there's the Dubevic angle, which is Eastern European, Slovenian, German, you know, your sausages, your cheeses, your breads, your yeah, stuff. I love Germanic food, but as long as I'm alive, it will never be posh to order schnitzels. So they try the German thing in the early 80s to mid 80s. That didn't work uh, with conjunction with many things. So we stopped doing that. Uh, the Club of Lebanon came over and went, we just want to grill some steaks. Then they got a few gas grills or charcoal, shoved it up out front. Everybody loved it. Then we went to the big grills we have now. And on the weekend in the summer, we'll have 1,200 people. They always laughed because, you know, people are like, why would you let people cook their own food? And he said, because every couple gets a bottle of wine and every couple buys one to go home. So, yay. I had an uncle both grew up in Collinwood. Where the winery was was 160th 160, or 167th, right on St. Clair. I was a little kid back then, but you know, they grew the grapes here and then transported them to Cleveland and they made wine. It was like a like a neighborhood men's club, so to speak. They hung out and they, you know, they played cards, they drank, they you know, they would cook sauce. I mean, we were Italian, so they, I, you know, they would cook sausage and, and have sausage sandwiches and, and that, you know, that kind of stuff. The neighborhood was really getting, it was changing. Yeah, it was. Yeah, for 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 business, uh, for the for a winery, it was time to come out to the country. When the grapes didn't produce, Tony went to work. And then I started disking the vineyards in the field, and I wanted to go to work, and he says, no, you'll make $3, I'll make 10 So it worked out real well, and I had the kids with me all the time, you know, right out in the vineyard with me. Prohibition hit, that's what the winers in California, they, they couldn't sell wine, so they were selling juice to everybody. You had wineries that were just selling, you know, Juice to home winemakers, probably selling wine illegally too. I mean, back in the day, you know, you did what you had to do to make some money, you know. This is during the Depression years. About the same as far as what they did, and, you know, they were just in different different neighborhoods, basically, you know. You know, a lot of them were Italian. They weren't all Italian, but, you know, you had different pockets of different nationalities. But today, I mean, there's none of those left. I mean, they're all gone. Basically, fates out uh, as the group got older. They were all about my age. I'm the only one left now. And Are any of their vineyards still around? Nope, I think they're all gone now. The last one, it was in Vermilion, and the last I heard, it's pretty well run down. He's gone, that was the end. <laughs>